Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Broyles, and on behalf of the American Foundation for the Blind, I'd like to welcome you to AFB's celebration of Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2018. Next slide, please. I'd like to start with just a few housekeeping items. First and foremost, as indicated in the webinar invite, captioning is available, and the link to that captioning is https colon slash slash www.streamtext.net slash player question mark event equals AFB webinar. And that captioning URL will be pasted in the chat window in just a moment. As we progress through today's presentations, I'm sure there will be questions. And we would ask that you please hold your questions until each speaker has been finished um, their individual presentation. And then at that point, there will be time for questions. Also, we ask that everyone please turn off their webcams. Uh, we've went through and manually done this. Uh, I don't see any on, but if your webcam is on, please make sure it's disabled to help with bandwidth and lag and that sort of thing. Also, we just went through and did a mass mute on everyone. Um, when you're ready to ask your question, you'll need to unmute yourself. And there's a few different ways to do that. You can select the microphone icon, or you can, if you're talking on the telephone and listening in that way, you can push star six to unmute yourself. If you're on a Macintosh computer, you can use shift plus command plus A to mute and unmute yourself. Or if you're on a PC, you can use Alt plus A to mute and unmute yourself. In addition, if you'd like to get our, get our attention a different way, there's also a raise hand function. And you can do that by clicking the raise hand button or by the following keyboard commands. If you're using a Mac computer, the keyboard command for the raise hand function is option plus Y. Or if you're using a PC, the raise hand function can be achieved by using the Alt and Y keys simultaneously. Next slide, please. I'd like to begin today's presentation by introducing you to our three presenters. Uh, first is me, again, Christopher Broyles and I am the Chief Consulting Solutions Officer for the American Foundation for the Blind. With me today is Matthew Enoch. He is one of our accessibility engineers. And we also have Lee Huffman with us, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Access World. Next slide, please. In today's presentation, we will be covering five topics to help celebrate accessibility. The first topic we'll be talking about is the real world value of accessibility, which I will present. Then Matthew will be talking about some recent advances over the last year in the accessibility space. Lee will then be talking with us about Access World and some of the neat technologies that publication has last year. And then Lee will pass it back to me and I'll share about some of the common characteristics that I have observed in successful accessibility programs. And then we'll close things out by talking about some of the services and solutions that AFB Consulting offers to organizations and companies to help support their accessibility programs. And Matt and I will present that information together. Next slide, please.
Whenever I talk with organizations about the real world value of accessibility and why they need to be doing it, there's really four reasons that come to my mind. And the reasons aren't listed in any particular order here. But the first one, which relates to lawsuit mitigation, this one is not my favorite. In my mind and in my heart, this is why not why we should be doing accessibility. We should be doing accessibility for other reasons. But in my experience, when talking with organizations, the unfortunate truth does seem to be that lawsuits and the potential for lawsuits does seem to be the most powerful driving factor in getting organizations to do the right thing. In 2017, there were over 814 lawsuits related to website accessibility. Now, I have not read all 814, but all of the ones that I've looked at have all resulted in sort of the same end game. It's always been a settlement agreement whereby the organization commits to a given set of criteria to help ensure that their content is accessible, thereby ensuring they're not excluding any potential customers from using their uh, websites or PDFs or apps or what have you. Now, there have been a few exceptions. Five Guys is one exception. They went ahead and said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do a settlement agreement. We're going to take it to court. The court said, no, not going to happen. Not going to work. You got to make your stuff accessible. So I am not a lawyer, but my feeling in seeing all of the success in the accessibility space in 2017 is that though you can read the Americans with Disabilities Act word for word and you won't find website, mobile app, PDF, PowerPoint. You won't find any of those terms expressly written. But my feeling is that they have been interpreted to be there in the spirit of the ADA. It's more of an implicit thing, not an explicit thing. And we've been very fortunate that companies and attorneys and courts have seen it that way. That doesn't mean that will always be the case. So I am still Despite all the success we've had in 2017, I am still looking forward to the day when the Americans with Disabilities Act is expressly amended so that language is there about websites, about mobile applications, and about the digital space in general. So there is zero question, zero doubt. It is a given. It is a must. A second thing I like to talk about organiz talk about regarding accessibility when I talk with organizations relates to brand and publicity. I don't think there's ever been an age in which people's opinions can be shared so openly, so freely, and so vastly than we live in today with digital at our fingertips. Finger fingertips. We have social media. We've got Facebook, we've got Instagram, we've got Twitter. We've got discussion boards like Webe. If your organization is not doing right by its customers, that will bubble up. If your organization is doing right by its customers, that will bubble up. So the question becomes, what message are you hoping that your customer base is going to bubble up? Are you hoping they're going to bubble up, that they have a great experience on your website? Or are you wanting them to bubble up that it's a bad experience and they can't complete certain things, like being able to add items to a shopping cart? Along that same line of business value thinking, there's also the, the idea that if your digital properties are not accessible, you are purposely not reaching up to 20% of what could be your potential customer base. 
And that just doesn't make sense to me. A lot of organizations on a yearly basis have goals around revenue generation and around growth. An easy way to help with that is to make sure you're not excluding that potential 20% by making sure that your digital properties are accessible. Again, that's your websites, your mobile apps, etc. Accessibility helps you to reach the largest audience possible. I think that's a win. At the same time you're going through that effort to make sure that you're reaching as many customers as possible, you can take those same methods, those same tools, that same strategy, and you can apply that to your internal facing things for employees and new potential employees. Ensuring that your online applications are accessible will help to make sure that you're reaching, again, the largest ap applicant pool possible and that you're getting the best talent pool possible. Now, a lot of organizations, in my personal view, kind of take a cheap way out. They put up their application. They don't label their form fields. They don't label their buttons. And then they just put on a tagline. If you're an individual with a disability and you need help with this application, call this number. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that call this number approach. For me personally, what I think is wrong is it becomes a license for organizations not to try to be accessible. It is not hard to label form fields in an application. It is not hard to label your buttons like attach resume, save, submit the application. It just takes some time and some effort. And what I like is I like an application that is fully accessible, fully screen reader compatible, but still on top of all that has the, the call-in number. So the call-in number doesn't become the excuse to not to try. The call-in number is just the cherry on top of a well bit of a well-built Sunday. And that's what I like to see. Any questions about my my take on the real world value of accessibility? Again, you'll need to unmute yourself if you do have a question or a comment. Okay, at this time I'd like to go ahead and move on to the next slide and to the next presenter, which is Matthew. Matthew, Thanks. take it away. Um, yeah, so I'm Matthew, I'm the Accessibility Engineer with American Foundation for the Blind. And um, in the last year, we've had uh, some pretty big advances, uh, mostly from the web development and some mobile development side of um, the web content accessibility guidelines and the accessible uh, rich internet applications, respectively, the WCAG and the uh, ARIA or ARIA. Um, <clears throat> we had ARIA 1.1 was. Uh, the most recent version was accepted December 2017, um, and there's even new working drafts. Uh, one was published actually two days ago uh, with some changes to it. Um, the WCAG 2.1 was proposed. Um, they proposed a recommendation in April of 2018, and they're expected to um, accept that proposed recommendation sometime next month in June. So for WCAG 2.1, uh, it was proposed or public. The proposal was published in April of 2018, uh, with an expected adoption in June. It adds one new accessibility guideline, um, five new level A success criteria, seven new level double A success criteria, and five new triple A success criteria. Um, 
The changes are focused primarily on mobile and responsive design. Um, Non-text contrast, such as images, buttons, and other controls. Um, and enhancing input methods actually other than the keyboard uh, for either low vision or maybe some mobility impaired users, uh, those types of things. So the new guideline added in the WCAG uh, is number 2.5 and it's input modalities. And this deals primarily with touch and mouse click event behavior. Uh, since a lot of mobile applications, of course, with mobile applications, you're dealing with touch events and, um, and also on the desktop or laptops, you're dealing with click events. Uh, these guidelines are designed to enhance the requirements around what happens when you touch, um, when you actually push your finger down on the touch screen and release it, or same thing with the mouse, when you click and release it. Um, it's designed to make it easier for users to operate functionality through other input methods beyond the keyboard, so touch and mouse. Um, and it sets out the guidelines for behavior on click or touch. Uh, it also enhances the size of click or touch target requirements. So the button, you know, for um, a web or mobile application, you can't have the button so small that it's nearly impossible to click. Um, and then the behavior of motion controls, such as uh, swiping gestures, um, uh, motion controls actually involving, say, accelerometer of a phone or the orientation of the phone, those types of controls. There, the WCAG 2.1 also added uh, a lot of new level A and level A double-A success criteria. Uh, we have 1.3.4, which requires content does not restrict its view and operation to a single display orientation, such as portrait or landscape. Uh, there are a lot of users who use might use their phone in a fixed orientation, uh, maybe attached to something, and they can't rotate it from portrait or landscape. So this requirement is designed around the fact that every, every website or application should generally be able to be used in any orientation, uh, just in case a user cannot take it from portrait to landscape. Um, maybe it's physically mounted to, uh, say, a wheelchair or some other physical object and you're unable to rotate it. Um, 1.3.5 requires standard HTML5 autocomplete attributes. So this means when you're uh, on an address field or, say, um, billing or shipping address when you're buying something, then the autocomplete uses standard HTML5 uh, autocomplete setup. So a screen reader or other assistive technology interfaces with the autocomplete properly. Um, 1.4.10 is around content can be resized without loss of information or functionality and without requiring scro scrolling in two dimensions. And this is restricted for portrait content 320 pixels wide. So at minimum of 320 pixels wide, content only has to be scrolled vertically. And for horizontally scrolling content, um, this requirement applies to anything 256 pixels tall or taller. Um, for 1.4.11, we have uh, this extends the three to one contrast minimum to important graphical information, physical visible focus indi indicators and other interactive controls. So um, maybe the, a button itself, the text had high contrast, but the color of the button itself didn't have high enough contrast with its background. In this case, this extends the three to one contrast minimum to the color of the button itself and not just the text within the button. Uh, we have 1.4.12, which enhances the spacing requirements around text, making it easier to read for uh, low vision users. Um, we have 1.4.13, requires that tooltips do not obscure the parent element and that the tooltip is easy to focus on. And this is a this requirement, uh, we see a lot of issues with tooltips dealing with um, the tooltip might cover up the original control, and that's a that's a pretty big problem. 
It also requires um, getting into the tooltip with assistive technologies, say navigating it by keyboard, is required to be easy to do. Um, getting focus from, say, a button or an element that is focused on into the tooltip, sometimes it doesn't want to go, and this covers that requirement. Uh, 2.4.11, this requires that the keyboard shortcuts uh, use more than a single key, so screen reader controls are not hijacked. Uh, let's say somebody implemented a control that used the letter P or you know H. Well, the H key is headings on uh, most assistive technologies or screen readers, and implementing a control on a website that used the letter H as a shortcut that would cause a lot of problems for. Uh, screen reader users who are trying to navigate by headings and controls start being activated when unexpected. Um, and then 4.1.3, this requires the use of ARIA live regions for visible status messages. So if you are adding something to your cart and there's a visible status message that says, uh, you know, three items added to your cart, this is requiring that an ARIA live uh, setting is used so assistive technologies announce that text that the, let's say those three items were added to your cart. Uh, for ARIA or 1.1, the accessible uh, rich internet applications, uh, this focused on adding new properties and roles to allow better ways for developers to provide context to users. Um, a couple of the big ones are ARIA key shortcuts, and this almost goes back to that, um, one of the last WCAG guidelines where uh, if they use a, if a developer uses a custom keyboard shortcut on their website, this require, this is a attribute that allows a screen reader to, or assistive technology to announce, hey, this control uses this keyboard shortcut. Now this doesn't actually set up the control to use that shortcut, but it just makes it so that, uh, let's say you're using JavaScript and, a custom, and it's looking for a custom keyboard shortcut to activate a control, this, uh, this attribute is able to tell the screen reader, hey, this control uses this new shortcut that the developer set up. And that way it makes it easier for the screen reader user to find or to understand what the shortcut is. Um, ARIA modal is a big new attribute. Um, modal controls are one of the major sticking points for web accessibility from what I've seen. Uh, it's often done incorrectly. Focus can go behind the modal screen or the modal dialogue. And the ARIA modal attribute tells the screen reader or assistive technology, hey, keep, keep focus within this window or this modal dialogue because that's what we want it to do. And this makes it much easier for developers to set it up so that the focus doesn't go outside the dialogue and the, the user knows, hey, this is a modal dialogue. You're supposed to stay within this until you either close it out or complete what it's asking for. Um, the next one's ARIA error message. This is used to associate an error message with control that is only exposed when ARIA invalid is true. So if you're filling out a form and you've done something wrong, there's an error message. This way, the error message can be set up so that when it, when ARIA invalid is set on that control because something is wrong, the w error message is read when you focus on that control. And that way this doesn't rely on, this, this allows developers not to rely on setting focus to a box of error messages or other area on the screen. And it really prevents a lot of jumping around and focus issues. And this is pretty big, pretty uh, helpful for developers. Uh, next, we have ARIA Current, which is, again, extremely useful. This is so you can inform the user which item they are on within a collection of items. Uh, this could be the current page in a breadcrumb style of navigation, or if you're in a multi-step process like checkout uh, when purchasing something, this could be used on the navigation to say, hey, you are in this step of the checkout process. Uh, and finally, we have ARIA Details. And this is used to indicate an element that gives details for the current one. So let's say you have um, a product, 
and it has a title, you could use something like ARIA details to point to the detail section with all, all of your, like say specifications or the you know, written text detailing what the object is. And this can be pretty handy for uh, pointing a user to where the details will be for that item. Um, and then finally, there are a lot of new roles, including feed, search box, switch, and more. And these are used so that uh, when you focus on an item like for feed, this role is used for uh, social media feeds where, you know, every time a company posts a new Twitter post and there's a little box on their website with all their new Twitter posts, this can indicate, hey, this is a social media feed where new items are being posted all the time. Or search box um, so you know hey this is where I can use to search this web page uh, switch sort of like a check box but it toggles slightly differently and that can be used to indicate that and there are a few other more that uh, along the same lines um, but they, uh, there was a lot of updates to aria 1.1 roles um, as far as other technologies, uh, Microsoft was demoing their Kane controller, which is a virtual reality controller uh, that allows a visually impaired user to navigate and interpret VR environments and using a white cane style controller, and it's set up to mimic typical cane behavior. A physical brake stops the cane controller's movement when it hits a virtual object in the VR world, a speaker attached to the cane vibrates it to mimic the different types of vibratory feedback from rough or carpeted surface. And a spatial sound system is used to mimic the sounds of the cane hitting various objects such as wood, metal, plaster, concrete. Um, so the example they gave was a person was walking around a room with a, with this cane troller and the virtual room had a trash can and a metal table and the user was able to identify the plastic trash can because of the sound and the way that it the cane would bounce when it quote unquote hit the, the trash can and then when it hit the metal table it would make a much higher pitched pinging sound to duplicate the cane hitting metal. Um, Amazon has added captions to Echo's their Echo devices with screens. So users with hearing loss are able to take advantage of the uh, features of Alexa that Amazon incorporates into the Echo devices. And uh, last week at Google I.O., uh, they demonstrated the Google Assistant uh, feature called Duplex, which can call and book appointments for users without them needing to speak. So you say, uh, hey, Google, uh, book me an appointment at the salon and it will call the salon and the robotic voice will talk to the person and schedule the appointment for you without you needing to call. And this seems to be, have great potential for users with um, speech impairments. And that's all that I have. Um, are there any questions? And as, as a reminder, if you have any questions, you'll need to unmute yourself. Hi, um, this is Jason Page. I was wondering if you had any uh, details or information about the, um, the controller that Microsoft had made for the Xbox. I was reading some information around that, and I just thought it was another interesting technology that was out there. It seemed to be able to a port, port uh, a lot of the assistive technology um, uh, tools and with a lot of uh, like the, the audio ports on the back, so you could plug it in and to and set up really the controller to um, guide you through the process as your needs were uh, um, there. I'm not sure that I have seen that one specifically. Uh, I know a couple years ago they um, released what they called their Elite controller, which was more customizable, and I think that that came from uh, development of a controller for people with uh, some motor skill issues or 
um, maybe issues with hand disfigurations. Uh, but I have not seen that one with uh, additional audio features in the controller. Good morning. Just wondering if you can provide some or your best guess as to <clears throat> when uh, WCAG 2.1 will actually be um, become the an, an accepted standard. I, I know you said it's just it was just introduced. I remember seeing something about that, but I'm curious as if you have any idea about what the timeline looks like from from here's the draft to when it becomes uh, an accepted standard. So right now they are in the. They have a proposed recommendation. They've uh, gone through a couple uh, release candidates or recommendation candidates over the last two or three months. Um, they're expecting to formally adopt the current um, recommended proposal in June. Uh, I think there may be some minor changes just, just in terms of like spell check or wording but I don't expect they're going to change much between now and June. And just to add on to Matt's answer to that, the thing to keep in mind about 2.1 is it is an addition to 2.0. It's not a replacement. There's already talk of WCAG 3.0, which will be a full replacement, but that is several years away. And I have a, there are a couple questions in chat. Um, the first one is, can people use Google Assistant if they are unable to speak? Is there a typing option? Yes, uh, I, from my understanding and my experience with it, uh, you should be able to get the same features by typing the results out um, or typing your question out into the Google Assistant. However, I'm not sure if that will continue with the new features they've demonstrated or how well those new features will work with the text input. Um, next question was, um, do you have a URL? No, I'm sorry. Uh, how well supported is ARIA 1.1 by assistive technologies? Can we start using the new roles, et cetera, in working code? Uh, from our experience, the new roles are generally supported. I believe NVDA is supporting most of them, if not, I don't believe they support all of them just yet, but most of them seem to be working. Uh, there's still some issues with browser compatibility and user agent compatibility, uh, but most of the, from what I have seen, you can add most of these new roles and um, attributes alongside the legacy implementations. And it looks like they have designed ARIA, the new ARIA roles around. Um, they will take precedence over the old ones if they are supported. Uh, let's see, the next question. Uh, I don't have a URL that lists the addition and slash changes to ARIA 1.1 right now. Um, someone else posted the new WCAG 2.1 features. Um, and uh, Chris, I have, there's one question here. Will the slides be available after the webinar? Yes, there's going to be some marketing that AFB is going to do around this and ultimately it will be shared publicly, um, but it probably won't be for a week or so. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions? All right, if not, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Lee. Okay, Matthew, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for including me in the webcast today. My name is Lee Huffman, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Access World, which is Access, which is AFB's online technology magazine. My slide that I have up just lists some bullet points that I want to go over and cover today. One of those will be the history of Access World, Access World's content, Access World's readership, 
the future of Access World, how you can become a reader of Access World, and then we can take any questions uh, or comments from the folks that may be um, participating today. So a little bit of the history of Access World. Access World has been around for about 20 years and actually started as a publication, small newsletter run by a lady named Deborah Kendrick, and that was a publication called Tactic. And this publication was, she created because she felt that people who are blind or visually impaired needed a better way to learn about technology products. Mainly at the time, it was assistive technology or access technology products. Learn about what's available, how well it works, does it function well under this condition or that condition, and make sure that people have more information before they actually select or purchase a product. So that was her initiative for creating Tactic. And around the 1998 timeframe, Access World or AFB became a familiar with Tactic and thought it would be a great idea for AFB to acquire Tactic and hopefully take that uh, newsletter that she had started and take it to a larger platform to reach more and more folks to be able to spread that information. And that's exactly what happened. AFB acquired Tactic, they changed the name to Access World, and was able to leverage the resources of the American Foundation for the Blind to create what was then a print publication. Access World initially started in large print and on audio cassette tape. And every two months, that package would arrive at your home or arrive at your office. And that was how people subscribed and paid for uh, as a subscription fee, like a traditional magazine for Access World. And those were the early days. And in 2000, AFB became a digital resource online. And so did Access World. Access World became online in the year 2000. And currently, every back issue of Access World up until that point is available archived on Access World. And uh, at the top of the slide, I've got afb.org slash aw, which will take you to the, a, uh, the Access World page where you can actually even go back and look at those back issues if you would like to. Many of them you know, are obviously uh, and thankfully outdated uh, as technology has moved forward, but that is a great way to get some information that still may be relevant and also be able to get a historical perspective of how far we've come. So after AFB became an online publication in the year 2010, July 2010 specifically, Access World became a monthly publication, moving from every two months to a monthly publication. So we doubled our content at that time. And over the time period, at Access World, our content, which is the second thing we're going to talk about, has really changed. In the beginning, it was mostly the review of access or assistive technology. And we've gone through several different phases. We have looked at over the years, as many of you, if you are Access World readers, you will remember some of our series of informational articles on office equipment. Most specifically, we did articles about the access of multifunction document centers, which these are the big, large printer, copy, or scan fax devices that are in most every office, school, um, across the country. We were able to work with companies like Canon and Xerox and Ricoh, um, Lexmark to evaluate some of the accessibility features they were building in, and in some cases that weren't unfortunately being built in. Access World editor, uh, myself at the time, and some of our other former writers were able to present with Canon at ATIA and CSUN to make more folks known about these products that were including uh, access features. We've also looked in Access World at medical devices. We have done informative inter uh, interviews with medical professionals and reviews of blood glucose meters, uh, insulin pumps, insulin pens, as many people deal with the um, losing vision due to diabetic retinopathy. Many people have to live independently and use these devices to monitor their blood sugar levels every day. So we have been written articles about the accessibility of those types of devices. We have also, over the years, looked at small visual displays and ways to increase the readability of small visual displays. If any of you can remember back to the days of the flip phone or the candy bar style phone, most of those devices uh, had very few, if any, speech output features. The For people who have low vision, the screens were very small, they were hard to read, they were not um, adaptable in any kind of way to make them the fonts larger or uh, change contrast. So the need for improved readability of small visual displays was taken on by AFB and we wrote about this in Access World. And today, obviously, we have uh, smartphones that have very large, bright and adaptable uh, displays, which additionally have the speech output. 
we used to do a lot of articles about screen reader and screen magnification software. For example, the Zoom texts and the JAWS, window eyes at the time, NVDAs. And we would do a review every time a new version would come out. We've moved away from some of that and we've gotten into more accessible mainstream technology or the accessibility features built into those pieces because it's happening more and more. So most of our coverage in Access World today relates to mobile, whether it be tablets or smartphones and the apps that are associated with those, whether they be access technology apps or mainstream apps that just happen to be accessible. So uh, whether it be the U.S. Airways app or whether it be something like uh, Blind Square or uh, GPS wayfinding, all these new technologies are changing the content of Access World to keep up with those as well. We also cover the review of technology books, for example, iOS for All, or um, getting started with the iPhone and, I and iOS 11 is another one that we've just recently done to help people find other resources, more in-depth resources about getting started and using technology. We also do a lot of conference coverage. And this year, for example, we've done conference coverage related to the Consumer Electronics Show, which was in January, so, which is CES. We've looked at ATIA, CSUN, and AFB's own AFB Leadership Conference coverage. And one of the reasons we do this, and the main reason, is to bring the technology and information at those conferences to our readers. It's difficult, if not impossible, for everyone. You know, we're very fortunate in my position to be able to go to these and learn about the new, the latest, and what's coming. And we want to be able to have Access World readers have access to that information as well. And so we're doing more conference coverage in, in Access World. And one of the things I want to point out, you know, as the technology in general has changed and advanced, you know, we've been changing and advancing in the way that we cover content and also the content that we cover. And one of the things that Christopher mentioned in the beginning was some of the highlights of the year. And I want to mention three things that stand out to me as the editor of Access World that were new sort of technologies over the year. Now, these are only three in the interest of time because there were several. But IRA, which is um, A-I-R-A, different from ARIA. But IRA is a pair of glasses that has a camera built into those glasses. And through that piece of access technology, a person is able to relate to a actual person, which is called an agent on the other end, who can look through the lens of the glasses or the camera mounted on those glasses and help a person who is blind or visually impaired navigate their surroundings. They can read documents. They can help them find things that maybe they have uh, become misplaced. They can uh, help them guide through airports, a work situation, a home situation. Uh, where sighted assistance just may not be available. Another one that is really, these are sort of wearables, and it's the iris glasses from Iris Vision. These are for people who have low vision, maybe macular degeneration, cataracts, something that was causing a low vision situation. And these are a set of goggles, and there are others besides Iris, but uh, one of them is Iris. And they are virtual reality glasses that many times are used by gamers or people who play a lot of games on through the computer. And the virtual reality headsets use a Samsung phone and the camera of that phone and the processing power of the phone to magnify both distance and close-up or desktop viewing uh, in a way that is really meaning for people who have different types of low vision. There are ways of magnifying text, creating different types of backgrounds and foreground colors that you might expect from a electronic magnifier. You can create bubbles to zoom in on different types of text and customize that in a way that helps the person individually. So that's another interesting thing as far as wearables, where technology is going, things that we're going to be covering more of in Access World. And also as an app, the Seeing AI app, which was recently this past year made available by Microsoft, has really been you know, a game changer in technology. It used to be, and it still is, but uh, the people had to buy several pieces of technology or have several tools. For example, the Seeing AI app from Microsoft has several components. It has a short text identification. So if you need to read small bits of text, maybe on a card or a pamphlet, it can do that. It can do full page text OCR. You can have a currency identifier, a color identifier, there is a scene where you can take a picture of a scene and tell you what's in that scene. For example, corner office with big window. That's was my dream picture, but um, 
It can have things like that to tell you what a scene may be. It has handwriting, uh, recognition, and there's also light recognition. So if you need to know whether or not you need to turn on light or turn off light, maybe in your home or office, you can use the Seeing AI app for that. It used to be, and of course, that is downloadable free from the app stores. And it used to be you would have several devices, each costing $100, $200 for each of those. And so this is a great turning point where we can download to our smartphone something that will you know, really life changing as absolutely free for those who have uh, smartphone access. So those are three that I want to call out specifically that we've written about in Access World. And as that technology moves forward, we will continue to cover uh, that as well. One other mention I'd like to make about our Access World content is we do have focused issues. Uh, January of every year is always our, based on Lewis Braille's birthday, it is the Braille technology and Braille issue where we look at new devices that are coming out, with, such as the Polaris Mini or others that might be available related to Braille technologies. February is always our low vision awareness uh, issue. So we are very lucky to be partnering for the past two years and hopefully next year as well with Mississippi State University as a partner to help sponsor that content. And as part of that, we focus on people who may be aging into low vision and talking about the importance of a low vision evaluation and concentrating those articles in the February issue toward lower tech or uh, less complex tech for people who are new to the subject. In that issue, we also try to incorporate uh, a deaf or hard of hearing component as well. So people who may be aging and experiencing vision loss as well as hearing loss to find devices or access or mainstream technology that can benefit those individuals as well. So the July issue is always our back to school issue where we focus on things that will help students in a classroom, accessible textbooks, how to talk to your instructors about accommodations that you may need, getting people ready for going back to school. October is always our employment month where we talk about uh, the importance of you know, preparing for the job search process, some access technologies and mainstream technologies that will help in that capacity as well. The November and December issues are always geared around the holidays, gifts for ideas for people with vision loss. Uh, we also look at the accessibility of many shopping websites and shopping apps that people can use and just regular gift ideas for people who may be experiencing gift or vision loss that are on your gift list. So we always try to focus some of our issues throughout the year on specific topics that people uh, can you know, really focus in on and get specific information on those areas. So our readership at Access World, we have, of course, people who are blind or visually impaired of all levels of um, light perception, all the way up to you know, higher levels of low vision. We have people that are friends and family of people experiencing vision loss, employers of people who are, have vision loss, and also companies that make the technology. So for example, when we write about a product and review it in Access World, quite often there is critique of that product in some way, of one thing or two that could make it much better or much more useful. And the companies that create this technology, we usually always partner with them. We never pay for a device uh, to be reviewed. They are always on a lending situation. So we try to maintain that type of relationship. Once we finish with a product, we send it back and the manufacturers read, of course, you know, what we write. And many times what we find is that in the next version of a product, a suggestion made by an Access World author will be incorporated into new versions of the product. So we're very happy that not only are we providing information for people, we're also providing ideas and constructive criticism to the manufacturers who make this technology to make the next versions possibly more useful or better for, for, for folks. We have approximately, uh, and this has grown over time and we're very proud that it has continued to increase, about 45,000 individual unique visitors to Access World every quarter. And so that is a little bit about where our readership is at the moment. And of course, that is, has increased. It continues to increase over time. So that's a little bit about the reach that Access World currently has. For the future of Access World, one thing that we would like to do is, while maintaining our current readership, to expand the readership to folks such as uh, the larger companies, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Apples of the world, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, IBM, to include those types of folks in a more uh, engaged level, possibly where we could have case studies or 
uh, situations that these companies can write about and talk about so we can have business to business learning through Access World, where, for example, ATIA or AT&T can learn from a Verizon aspect and how they created more accessibility either within their corporation uh, for hiring practices or internal access, or whether it be the way they've increased the accessibility of their products or services or website so that they can learn from each other. And also people who experience vision loss can learn what these larger companies are doing uh, to create more accessibility. So we would like to expand the readership of, of Access World and get that into uh, our pipeline as well. So how can you become a reader of Access World? One of the best things that you can do and maybe the best and easiest place to start is by going to afb.org slash aw. This takes you to our main landing page for Access World. And from that page, you can select the, the button to sign up for Access World Alerts. And Access World Alerts are emails that come directly to your inbox, of course, and that is twice a month for the beginning of the month when the Access World goes live. If some of you are readers, then you know that this is a table of contents with the titles of the all the articles in that issue with a little teaser copy to kind of entice you to read from that um, email. You can click the link, select that link, takes you back and forth to each individual article so you can read from that alert. There's also a mid-month alert that comes toward the middle or end of the month to remind you, hey, have you read Access World? Did you read this month's issue? Uh, to keep you reminding of, of the availability and the resource of Access World. So afb.org slash aw is one way to do it. You can sign up for the alerts, which we would love for you to do. And also a, an increased part of our readership is those readers who read through the Access World app, which is also available free at the Apple App Store. So you can download that onto your, your smart device, your tablet, your smartphone, and read Access World there. And through the app, you can read the current issue. It's updated every time a new issue goes live. And we know we're happy to have at least 15 plus percent of our readership currently reading through the Access World app. And um, that's a little bit of an overview of where we are at Access World, where we've been, where we're looking to go, and about our readership and who reads Access World. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those at this time. Well, if no one else is going to ask, I just want to commend uh, you guys for what I consider to be one of the one of the best um at publications out there your articles are you know you you don't speak down to the audience but you don't you don't use geek speak and uh i appreciate that i'm sure other people do as well but uh good job and uh, keep it up and thank you well thank you for that we appreciate your uh, your comment and we're we do our best to, to reach as many people as possible and we thank you for that thank you very much And just so you know, as a, as a just as sort of a caveat to what we've been talking about, our Access World authors, you know, Deborah Kendrick, who actually initiated Tactic that became Access World, is still an active writer, uh, author for Access World. That's for over 20 years. Bill Holton is another one of our authors. Jamie Pauls was recognized two years ago by ACB for Excellence in Writing, and that was one of his articles on uh, UEB. Janet Ingber is a writer for Access World. Shelley Brisbane has written in the past and does for us as well, JJ Meadow and others uh, that we have from time to time. Aaron Priest, who is a staff member at AFB, also writes for Access World. And all of the folks who write for Access World, including myself, we are all either blind or who have low vision. And so we're not only looking at the technology, but we're looking at it as from the perspective of our daily use. And we use these devices or these types of devices in our daily life. So we have that perspective and you know, bring that to our articles and our readers as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, Christopher Broyles. Thanks, Lee. Okay, our next topic are the common characteristics for what I consider to be a, quote, good or mature accessibility program. And there's really two things I want to share. I want to talk a little bit about the scope for an accessibility program, as well as a framework for an accessibility program. So 
Talking about scope, when I work with organizations, I like to help them transition into what I consider to be an enterprise-wide view for accessibility. A lot of times when I start working with organizations, they are starting at a risk mitigation perspective, meaning it goes back to that idea of not wanting to be sued. What is the minimum we need to be doing to comply with the law? And that typically lets them focus in on customer-facing digital assets like websites and apps. And that's okay. But the problem is a lot of accessibility programs stop there. And for them, that is accessibility. That is the program. And that's what it means. They overlook so many other critical areas of a, quote, true accessibility program. Some examples being physical spaces. The assumption is you build an office building, you build a store, um, ADA compliance is part of the construction, and usually they're right. The hallways are the right width. You've got your handrails in the restroom. Um, you've got your doorways the right width, et cetera, et cetera. But what they don't understand is that compliance with ADA building codes can only take you so far, and it doesn't mean you're creating a truly inclusive experience for your customers or your employees. So a lot of times we'll work with organizations to help them think about what is 2.0? What is experience 2.0? And that's conversations around tactical floor elements. It's conversations around appropriate contrast between your walls and your floors. It's conversations around lighting controls and all these other things that can really help to create optimal experiences that you don't necessarily see in the ADA building codes. Importantly, organizations don't often think about intersection points where your digital and your physical come together for your customers. A great example of this is a self-checkout at a grocery store. You've got your digital piece, which is the little tablet screen thing that's reading to you as you scan your items, and then you have to push the button to do the checkout. You've got your physical piece, which is the conveyor belt height, the positioning of that display unit, the positioning of the credit card, and a lot of times how things go together, the digital and the physical, to create that optimal experience and optimal user flow. Organizations aren't thinking about that. And of course, everything I've talked about so far has been customer facing. Everything I just shared also, imply, also applies to employee-facing things and helping employees to be the most successful that they can be at their job, making sure they have the right employee accommodations, making sure the office is set up in a way to facilitate movement, um, lighting, etc. And a lot of times organizations just don't have this holistic view of accessibility. They think consumer-facing website, if I get that good, I'm safe. And that's just the wrong perspective. It's too narrow of a scope. It's not an enterprise-wide view. The second piece that I wanted to cover is sort of a framework for how you can actually do all of those things. And there's really four core elements that in my experience, every accessibility program needs in order to make a lasting, sustainable, effective change. First and foremost, you need resources. You need people. A lot of times when organizations are starting out in the accessibility space, they hire one person, they call that person an accessibility lead, and that person's function is to go forth and evangelize accessibility and to talk about it and to do some teaching. But at the end of the day, one person does not and cannot make a program. So when I talk to organizations about resourcing, 
I talk to them a little bit about having resources who can do the day-to-day, the tactical, to keep the, the engine going. And I talk to them about having resources that can focus on the programmatic and strategic, plan for today, plan for tomorrow, adapt, that sort of thing. In addition to resources, you need an actual training program to help evangelize accessibility throughout the organization. And it cannot be a one-and-done program. It can't be a -a once-a-year thing. When I work with organizations, I encourage, you know, a a role-based training curriculum so that individuals can learn the accessibility responsibilities within their roles. So developers can know X, Y, and Z. Content authors can know X. Graphics designers can know A and B, et cetera, et cetera. And then I encourage them to do continual monthly brown bags on new accessibility topics with the idea of keeping accessibility alive. And I also encourage them to develop some sort of a um, as-you-need-it resource, like maybe a wiki. So as a developer's sitting there hammering out code, if they're not sure how to do an accessible carousel, they can go to this wiki, do some reading, and keep cranking out code. That on-demand, have it right then and there training. You're going to need tools to help with the testing, to help with the metrics collection, to help with the dashboarding, to show accessibility progress as a whole. And underneath it all, you're also going to need some standard operating procedures, some governance, and some policies. Something that gives what you're doing teeth, gives what you're doing a foundation. Something that you can point to when you're telling an organ, when you're telling a specific group within the organization, they need to be complying with WCAG or whatever the standard is. An important thing about the policy is it does have to have some teeth and it has to give the accessibility office some power. You need to be able to say, if your website's not accessible, it can't go live. That's pretty drastic. And you'll probably get some pushback. But I guarantee you, if you do it once and you actually stop something from launching, that group has learned. That group will not make that mistake again. They will plan accessibility throughout the life cycle, which is the way it should be handled. And other neighboring groups in the organization, other product groups, other business groups, other technical groups, they're going to hear that product group X fell flat when it came to accessibility. They're going to hear that they missed their launch date. And those leaders of the the other groups are going to say, that cannot be us, guys. Let's make sure we're doing accessibility right. So even though it's sort of an extreme line to draw, in my experience, you only have to draw it once. The group only has to violate it once, and it won't happen again. Next slide, please. And our last slide today is just a little bit about how America, the American Foundation for the Blinds Consulting Group can help you in your organization. When we talk to our clients and potential clients, we really frame it as two levels of solutions. We've got tactical solutions for accessibility that are meant to help with the day-to-day. These are things like digital accessibility reviews of mobile apps, websites, PDFs, PowerPoints, etc., against WCAG 2.0 or 2.1, media evaluations, video evaluations against CVAA, product evaluations like refrigerators, microwaves, TVs against UAAG, and more. We also do physical space reviews, which we've talked about. And of course, we also do actual usability testing with individuals with visual impairments, cognitive impairments, hearing deficits, et cetera, to help us identify you to help us identify issues above and beyond the standards so that we can help our partners truly create inclusive, engaging, exciting experiences for their customers and employees. And then we also offer programmatic solutions for accessibility. So these are higher level things like around strategy. We can help with policy, governance, standard operating procedures. 
we can help your organization make decisions around dashboarding and tooling. AFB does not have any tooling. We are tool agnostic. We have relationships with a lot of the key vendors. We are not married to one specific tool. We find that each organization we work with has different needs, has different budgets, has different ways things are set up, have different technical needs for what the tool can do. And by having multiple partnerships, we're able to help make sure that the organizations we work with get the best tool that's out there for their specific need. We can also help with staffing models and actual staffing. And of course, we can help with evangelism and culture change within an organization. For our engagement models, you can literally buy our time one hour at a time. We can't do a lot in the help in one hour, but we do work with a lot of community colleges, for example, and they have to buy hour per hour just because of budget constraints. We also allow for bulk hour purchases, starting at 40 block hours, all the way up through 1,820 block hours. And we have a pricing scheme set up that the more block hours you buy in one chunk, the better per hour rate we're able to give you. The nice thing about our per hour rates is they are below industry standard. We are a not-for-profit. At the end of the day, yes, we do want to make some revenue off of our consulting projects. Doesn't need to be a lot, but we want to make something so that we're covering our base costs and that we're turning around and being able to invest money back into AFB so we can do all these wonderful free things like Access World. And of course, we do offer a mix of remote and on-site solutions and services. To learn more about consulting and this information that I'm about to read, will also appear in the chat window. But to learn more about consulting, please check out www.afb.org slash consulting. Or feel free to email me, again, I'm Chris Broyles, at cbroyles, that's the letter C, my last name, B-R-O-Y-L-E-S, at afb.net. Or you can call me at 212 502 7612. Next slide, please. Okay, so that is everything for our formal presentation. We are about eight minutes over, so I, I think we could do maybe two minutes of questions and then wrap up at 210. Are there any final questions for any of the content or any of the presenters today before we wrap up? And again, please remember to unmute yourself. Uh, you said the slides would be available probably about a week or so. How would we uh, reach out in order to access this presentation at that time? So I'm still working with communications on it, but I have a feeling what will happen is once these slides are posted to YouTube with the captions and all of that wonderful stuff, I have a feeling we'll be sending out a mass email to everyone who's registered uh, for this webinar, so you can watch for that. You can also uh, watch the AFB blog. I'm sure this presentation will be mentioned there as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, I would like to thank everyone for attending our celebration of Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2018. Please plan to join us in 2019 and watch for that invite um, probably about a month before. Thank you. Bye, everyone.